What's up, everybody? Welcome to the podcast. So this week, uh, there was a short that I saw. I wish I'd been able to find the long form video of this. It was of Jordan Peterson. And it was Jordan talking about betrayal in a way that I found quite interesting. Mm. He talked about the high cost of reestablishing your mental model when you've been betrayed. And so he said, we put a lot of effort into forming mental models of other people, particularly people that we're very close to, and we predict things based on that. We use our understanding of that person if they're very close to us, sometimes also as mental models for ourselves, right? It relates to us, you know, I have this person and we have this relationship and that says X, Y, Z about me and of the world in general, right? People are like this. And so one of the things that makes betrayal so difficult and also sometimes difficult to detect is that the cost of reconstructing and destructing those mental models is incredibly high because it is not simply that you have to uh, lose the physical presence of a person in your life. The mental model that you've constructed is taking a lot of work has to go down. And then if that served of a, as a foundation of your mental model of yourself, so he gives the example, well, maybe I have to think now how gullible I am. And if I'm gullible and I had an, uh, an image of myself as somebody who was uneasily tricked, what does it mean to now look at my life as if I'm gullible? And what other mental models does that force me wow. to reevaluate? So what does he say? People avoid this? Well, or? it was 60 seconds. <laughs> this is unfortunate. <laughs> this is the problem with shorts. I was like, this is good. So I want to watch the rest of this. This is, yeah. it was one of his classroom speeches uh, that he did way back in the day. I was like, oh man, I would love to find this particular one. Uh, it, and it just got me thinking because I've, I've been thinking about the same sort of stuff uh, to a number of things. One, I've chatted with many people and gone through myself. And I think that one of the toughest things for people to come to terms with is betrayal by their own parents. Uh, when it's, even when it's egregious, sometimes when it's egregious, people are able to go, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I know that my parents did X, Y, or Z. But it is so hard for people to uh, feel betrayed by their parents when reflecting back on their childhood. And this really does give a strong indication as of why. Because in that case, the entire world the entire, like your career, your friends, the decisions that you made in order to account for a betrayal where perhaps your parents didn't protect you, didn't look out for you, didn't put your needs first, but instead put their own emotional needs first while telling you that they were taking care of you and they were mm. doing this out of love. To feel that betrayal rips your world out by the roots and the cost of such a thing is so enormously high that even if you're directed towards it, which I have, I've now, it's funny having done, uh, you know, MDMA and, and had friends do it to speak to them before a handful of experiences and after and watch the slow process, which is perhaps more easy from someone on the outside of them coming to terms with not the evil of their parents, because I think that one of the people, the things that people think is that if you were betrayed by your parents, that means that you had bad parents or that they were. Uh, they cannot be forgiven and that they, you know, are yeah. beyond redemption or something, which is not at all what it implies. It implies that they were human and uh, like many humans put their needs above their children's at various points in their childhood that were very formative in the construction of that child's understanding, worldview, and probably very damaging. Uh, but it's been very interesting to see people slowly and only with great time, space, and therapeutic assistance come to terms with the betrayals that they suffered early in life. And this was just a way for me to uh, conceptualize why that's so difficult. Yeah, yeah. To realize that you might be a victim of betrayal is um, costs a lot and it's better to avoid mm -hmm. is what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want to know what happens after the 60 second clip so I can see the <laughs> strategies uh, person might do in order to avoid that feeling of betrayal or what they do after they they've they've realized i've been betrayed and then they walk forward with yeah. this new identity of the betrayed one um I, I have a lot of questions for mr peterson yeah well i can tell you internally i know that one of the things that people do is they dissociate from the part of themselves that is aware of the betrayal so right before it before acknowledging that they've been betrayed before right? yeah. Yeah, yeah so so let's say that your parents which is very common um have an emotional outburst, 
do something that is not in your best interest and then tell you that they did that for you. Mm. Some part of you may understand that didn't feel good. <laughs> it, yeah. it definitely understands. That didn't feel good. I felt my needs. This did not attend to my needs. And now you're telling me that that was attending to my needs. So the part of you that is in this case sensitive, attuned, and empathetic to yourself needs to be split off and shoved into the unconscious mm. for you to maintain connection with the parent. So now you have are two people that I would say, I had a wonderful childhood. Blah, blah, blah. My parents would never do that. Oh, I'm so sorry for you that you suffered that. That's definitely nothing like what I experienced. And then, uh, but the part of them that will carry their empathetic connection with themselves is out of conscious experience. Uh, and so that is, I think, what happens for a lot of people. And then there are symptoms. Of yeah, yeah. And then if you're that person, then you walk around with a shadow that can't mm -hmm. recognize this in yourself and you're in probably most likely going to do it to people in the world because you think that this can't occur within your own sure. self. So I, like I just had one of these that I, I called our sister about, which was, again, I, I beat up on my own parents. I love them dearly. And uh, it's it's because they're they're mine. And yeah. I don't want to bring other people's parents into, the, into yeah. this. Uh, but I, uh, when I was little, I remember having uh, no tolerance for my little sister's hurt feelings. None. In fact, I would get enraged when we both wanted to use the computer for AOL. And for whatever, you know, we like ran there at the same time. We both put our hand on the mouse and I was stronger and I ripped it <laughs> hand or whatever. And then she would cry. I remember feeling enraged at the power of her being hurt to call upon help that would then come in and stop me from hitting her or taking the computer from her or, you know, monopolizing whatever scarce resource I wanted that she wanted at the same time. Uh, we just spoke about this, and I couldn't point to exactly when, but I do think, without meaning to, uh, at some point I got the message that hurt feelings are not, we don't have a lot of space for those. You can fight for your needs to be met, or you can persuade for your needs to be met. <laughs> But why are you laughing? <laughs> Just like remembering the exact scenes. Yeah, this, this makes sense to me. <laughs> yes. The, and w w again, I was oldest and it was like, you know, so there was people older than me teaching me the way that things would work. But it was... Uh, you learned what was allowed and what's not allowed. You can fight or you can talk me into it, but you cannot simply be hurt and, I, and uh, Emotionally express that me. to me and have me receive that without you forcefully injecting this into me. And... Uh, and so I am working on and feeling there's internally the part of me that you might call the, the feminine, the child feminine, the part that is not going to fight, is not going to persuade, is just in deeply in tune with feelings of hurt, is not totally connected inside of me. And so I look back on those experiences and I go, I was not connected with her, my sister's experience of hurt outside of me it was just what i was i remember feeling angry that she had a tool to get her needs met uh, that was unavailable to me yeah i was about to say yes and that this she can cry and get what she wants was that enraged me i remember that enraging me at the time and you know so the the fights occurred between me and her but i would say that the the wounding was primarily you know in my parents childhood and then in the way that without having looked at that particularly the way that they raised me, but I, like every other child, you can't address that with your parents also, at the there's, time. There's you just shape your world around that dysfunction. There's a problem with ages too mm -hmm. that's going on. Now you guys were close in age, but there's a time where like at 12 year old, it's time to like start growing up and not use crying as a boy to get what you want. We've mm -hmm. all seen the, and the doting mothers where the boy cries and gets yes. the video game and the extra snack. Of course. And there's a time where that no longer works. And you might've been experiencing maybe in this one where it's just like, it sucks being 10 years old and having not that ability, that tool where mm -hmm. I can cry and get what I want and you still having it at eight or seven. Mm -hmm. And then me at six where it's like, I get to cry and, and, yeah. I, and use my emotional tool to 
which it doesn't seem fair to you. And mm-hmm. <laughs> this is what you were gra- grappling with. I it wonder was all, if some... It was also before. It was. It, this is an old one, as I look back on it. I agree. <laughs> I agree. And also want to say, like, this is the problem I have with the younger generation, as you're like, you yeah. can't just do that. Yeah. It's not yeah. fair. You just... This isn't meant Learned to say that crying is the way to s- solve problems. Yes. This is to say that parenting is an incredibly complex thing. I cannot give anyone, my own parents, at least of all, a rubric yeah, yeah. on how it could have or should have gone. But I do think that what I'm trying to do, I know that what I'm trying to do, is to reconstitute all these split off parts of myself so that when I'm operating with someone who is totally dependent on me or just anyone in the world, that I'm not... That there's not parts of me that I've disowned that I could then act com- totally callously towards in the other person. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you are permissive endlessly where somebody cries and they always get what they want. It doesn't mean any of that. It, but it does mean that you're able to embody discipline with love, uh, sharing, you know, socialization with compassion for the difficulty of interacting with other humans and not having your needs met at the exact moment that you would like because you're now five instead of two yeah so i'm not this is not to say that any of this is easy but it is to say that i see and i I, it is to say that i think that the work to do is to recognize in many ways the parts of you that are split off which are often related to childhood which are often connected to a whole mental model of how the world works yeah it comes crumbling down, and for me, just a small one, I've done this many times now, given that I've been working on this for six years, was going, for the first time, I always had, as an adult, shame. When I looked back, I was like, that was mean, that was wrong. But there was no felt compassion. Like, I had internalized rules of how people, you don't do that, that's not right. You don't do that, and I'm ashamed that I did that, which is very different than... I, f- I know what it is like to be the hurt little one, stepped on, ignored, and whose cries don't count for, you know, to, to feel that inside of myself and say, well, how would one treat that if one wasn't just shunting that off into mm. the unconscious? And so this was just one little one. I, you know, we have lots of these that, that come up if you do breath work or things like that. Yeah. And uh, it's been good. I also, it's tied into a larger theme for me which has been looking intently in the places that you don't want to look. We talked many weeks ago, and I've, I'll continue to talk about it. I read King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. It talks about the four male archetypes, the archetype of the king being the uh, centerpiece of the mature male psyche. And one of the most important functions of the king is to see, to see his subjects, to see the kingdom, to witness without bias the state of things without flinching away or turning away from the dark side of things or the things that scare him or the things that he doesn't think he has the strength to conquer right and so uh some of that seeing i think that i've worked on and i encourage other people to do is in looking into your past and asking how you got here and what's going on in your romantic relationships and what things you have uh what what strengths you haven't acknowledged, what weaknesses you haven't acknowledged. This is all easier said than done. This makes me think of a clip I saw online with Chris Williamson and, uh, sorry to cut you off, and Alex Ramosi where they're talking about self-love. I don't know if you caught it. And Alex has a uh, worldview that he teleports himself as to an 85-year-old man and what would this man think mm-hmm. about this man now? And he doesn't like the idea of accepting who you are because there's always room to improve. Mm-hmm. especially if you're going to move towards that 85 year old man, which is true. And it's incredibly has no self love. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that just you, what, what you were saying of like being able to see and turn towards what the past and then having compassion and then moving forward. And which is not available. I felt in this talk, um, but he'll get really everything he wants if he's working towards that 85 year old man and realizing that there's always room to improve. Um, but I, I, also I think, think he also taking- loses. I, I really don't think, well, it, it's, it's of course helpful to imagine distance, but if you listen to 85-year-old men and the regrets about life, they regret working too hard. You know, mm-hmm. like, and, I, and I think that there's a, obviously there's an inability to imagine deeply what it would be like to be 85, to be looking actually at your end of days, to be weighing your life seriously. Uh, and this is where I go seeing like, oh, you want to imagine 85? This is what I, this brings me to what I want to do. That's an interesting thought. I want to go work in palliative care, man. I want to go sit with actual old people and 
actually look. And that's fucking scary. Yeah. Man. That is scary to do. Sit with rich old people. Sit with broke old people. Sit with different kinds of people. And don't just imagine what, what it would be like. Yeah, no, what but, I imagine, I imagine like, oh, I'm on a rocking chair and I wish I uh, <laughs> went to Disneyland with that one trip that I said I couldn't afford for that $400 and I should have gone. And then now I'm like, I'm going on this trip for $400 mm-hmm. to Disneyland. And yeah, it's a different thing than actually if you really internalize being See. on your last of days. See, and I think this is this is something I've been working on, which is your imagination about who people are what is happening, what would happen if you traveled. Like imagine me saying, I imagine myself in Spain. I've never been to Spain. I've never done any of this. But, and that helps me make decisions about what I would do. You could, that can give you some mental distance, but it's not actually going to create the emotional depth of that situation. So I'm not saying that, and, and even if an 85-year-old version of me, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to minimize regrets at age 85. So we, we also can have, have a, a direct different... experience with going to Italy with our family, which was romanticized. It <laughs> turned out to be an awful trip <laughs> yeah. where we walked around 100 degree Rome, yeah. just sweating and with no AC and hating it. Yeah. And so like that, we imagined having pasta <laughs> and beautiful uh, beaches and a awesome vistas and just connecting over deep culture of Rome. And what we got was no AC and we mm. left after four days. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, that's that, I understand that that was deeply motivating. Yes, to it, it was deeply motivating more. for me to watch. That's, uh, yes. But I, I think it's, I think you're right to say that that's actually not who, I didn't spend too much time figuring out who, he says, figure out who 85 year old you are. Henry is, Charlie is, who's 85-year-old Charlie. His maybe might be an optimizer maybe. that for his end of the days wants to get the most out and make the largest impact mm-hmm. uh, to get his message out. Sure. Um, man, when I hear that and say that out loud, I'm like, and then I rest, right? Then <laughs> I like, get to die finally. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No. Well, well I, I don't know what he is. I'm not, I'm not saying what would be best for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was extremely motivating, though, to listen to. He's like, the self-love shit he hears, he, he vehemently yeah, f- disagrees with. Yeah. I Well, I I guess I disagree with him. And uh, I, I know that our paths will lead to different uh, volumes of creation and different styles, and that that, that is totally okay. Um, when I think of that, I... Yeah, I, I imagine, again, haven't been there any more than he has... Um, I just wish that I would like suck the nectar of life up, you know, and like, and give of myself back. And that doesn't preclude creative efforts at her- Herculean amounts of it, but it does imply a disconnection from achievement or a more of a disconnection from achieving and more of a connection to what is coming out from my heart. And I think, I know, and I feel comfortable with where I am already, uh, that's going to provide well for me and the people around me. And um, like Alex says, in 500 years, no one's going to remember either of us. Yeah, so, yeah. so if he's got a billion and I've got 10 million, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there's different different ways of doing it. I do think it would be an interesting conversation. I, I don't, I, going back to the betrayal thing, I mean, he's, you've seen him maybe talk about his dad and his upbringing and the difficulties that he had. And yeah, oh my I God. see split off parts when I hear him talk about this. I hear split off, uh, it's okay to be you as, you know, yeah, yeah. not an achiever. Um, yeah, his book is pretty brutal to listen to. <laughs> Just like, And it. I'll say, he's a brilliant business philosopher. He's a, it like, the, from that way of being comes a tremendous generative power which is amazing and i'm grateful for Mm -hmm. and uh i hope that he continues i hope that it deepens and i disagree with that that i guess you might like call it perspective i i will have wanted more if that's you know i've I've seen you talk you gotta watch the clip yourself because it is nuanced and it doesn't you're actually could be not perhaps we ex- agree could not be yeah. exclusive yeah. in both worlds view he's just like when i tap into myself my most creative self is creating at a volume that mm-hmm. looks like everyone to work when mm-hmm. to me it's just creation i don't think um and i think I that's think, important is is like I, no one can tell other than him yes 
no one can tell other than him what is inside coming out from love and what is coming out from a need to be accepted and loved. Mm -hmm. I think that's different. What's coming out from love and what is coming out from desire to be loved. No one can know. Only him. Um, And so I leave that, that discernment to him. I got you off your first point, though, which was being the king and seeing. Yeah, so, I mean, I mentioned this, but uh, we, we kind of got there, is that I'm, I'm trying to pay attention to the areas in my life where I have not wanted to see. And by definition, when you don't want to see, you have a low level of awareness that you're avoiding seeing. But just some easy ones are when you're avoiding looking at your bank account, when you're avoiding looking at your credit card bills, when you... Don't when when you suspect someone's lied to you, but you don't uh, dig into it in order to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, when you there's I'm trying to think of others. When you don't step on the scale, these are the obvious and easy ones because you don't want to know the whatever it is or what's going on. Yeah. When you don't watch the documentary about how your food is created because you don't want to know. Yeah. So like your inaction is actually a, a really large action. Are you, yes, and there's a subtle difference to be clear. I think that my uh, not watching the news is actually a desire to see more clearly because there are things that you can look at that get in the way <laughs> yeah. of, of, of understanding noise. deeply yes. what is happening in your life and the world. And MSNBC in my estimation, does not help me see more clearly. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Fox or you like pick, name your poison. Yeah. Um, so you, again, you have to decide what counts as seeing for you, but where my food comes from seems pretty important. One of them that I mentioned was death. We had a death duel on. Uh, Going to have another guy, hopefully, who worked in palliative care for many years. And these people are different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People who sit with death are different people. And... When I look at, I've, when have I seen a body at funerals? I've never seen someone die. I've never seen the act of dying, which is incredible for a 35-year-old human. That's just not real. We watch Chimp Empire, and it's, they cut. there's war, there's death, there's, well, well they but, cut it out. They cut it out for me, but the chimps are aware of, it. it is, it is in their sphere of existence at yeah. the very least. And I imagine for humans for a long time, it was for them as well. And it has been effectively ripped out of of life uh for the for many people in the west so i'm taking a course right now i'm going to go into it slow because i genuinely am afraid of it yeah uh i'm taking a course on being a death doula which has at the end of it the option to go sit in palliative care as like an apprentice and uh even be there (laughs) wow yeah that's scary that one is i i give me give me time for that one that I can be there disconnected, honestly. Exactly. It's like, I can, I can be there and just, but I don't want to do that. And perform duties. I want to be there of service, which mm-hmm. is, I have to first, in order to be of service, it's like, I have to attend to my own fears that this is going to create in me of the people that I love and myself and whatever. And I have to address those. Mm-hmm. And then I can begin to be there be for with, them. Yeah, I gotta be, be like, you. are you scared? And it's like, that's not the time yeah. or place for <laughs> yeah, this yeah. person to hear my fears about my death yeah, while yeah. they're dying. What do you see? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think that uh, it's very important. It's coming online for me, this seeing, this not shying away. And it's a very subtle thing because one of the ways in which you can avoid seeing things is that you can have full-on experiences but dissociate. So I think that people who try to be really brave sometimes, and they're like, I'm going to do this, is they just run headfirst into scary things. They jump into palliative care. They get there, like you described. They can be there, but they're not, they're not in it, mm-hmm. right? And so it's, there's also a, an important patience, which is when I look, I intend to look from a place of grounded centeredness and not of I'm pointing my eyes there, but so, but I've gone somewhere else. Yeah. And to check the box of having looked, I tend to look with a deep curiosity and willingness to learn. So it's a, I think a very mature energy that I'm trying to apply 
more consistently. Yeah, yeah. And I'd encourage other people to. So there was that from my Jordan Peterson short. One of the things that came up, you, the blind side story. Do you, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you, I read a little bit. I, I, you can go look online and find the specifics of it. Do you want me to recall some of it? Sure. You guy, can. guy, Michael Ower, who, when he around, uh, geez, um, low income, one of multiple children, um, African American athlete when his teens had a troubled childhood growing up and then in 10th and 11th grade started becoming a football star, got adopted by this family called the Tua, I don't even know how to say their last name family, I don't by know. A, a family in, I think, where do they live, Missouri? You and, know the details better than yeah. I. Yeah, so he got adopted and then it became a, a book and then a movie, his story of resilience, of struggle, of finding love in this family and then eventually making his dreams come true, which wow. is... He grew up poor, uh, struggled. Uh, parents weren't really there or supportive. Found this adoptive family through his high school. Went to Missouri, two-time state champion, uh, three-time offensive tackle, and then NFL star for eight or nine years. And this movie came out and made three hundred million dollars with Sandra Bullock mm -hmm. as the leading actress and won an Oscar. Yeah. Um, came out last week or this week that he says he found out he was never actually adopted by his family. By his parents and that 18 he signed conservatorship which is the same thing britney spears is under God. which is they own your entire uh likeness and your estate and it's um a tough article to read because you honestly want to just get him on the phone and figure out what his story is and then the parents on the phone but uh he describes three moments where he really had split away feelings toward his early family who he loves to this day he he describes um the most recent one being finding out that they, he signed a conservatorship with them and not wasn't actually adopted. That he had been calling them mom and dad and they encouraged him this whole time. And he's not been seeing the profits or the royalty checks from um, the movie the same way they were. And his family has maintained the entire time um, that they weren't being paid from the movie. They were only making money on their um, tours or books or whatever. Um, but that actual story of him that came through the movie, they weren't making money. Uh, which I think he's disputing as a lie that they were earning royalty checks and they were getting enriched from his struggles and story. And um, so that's one that he was not actually adopted. It was conservatorship, which he found out last February, which is why the story is coming up 14 years after the movie aired. He just found out and he's uh, trying to recover some of his losses and he isn't happy. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, the story portrays him in a light that he doesn't think was true, but he agreed with the overall message of trying to inspire people. So that's why he also didn't speak up. I didn't watch the movie, but apparently they describe him as a dumb kid growing up, trial, troubled childhood that um, was academically behind. And he's, his point was like, I was academically behind, but never really had a stable home or uh, classroom. And once I did, I did very well in school. And then uh, this narrative sort of played out in the NFL where I was dumb and uh, people didn't consider me a leader and mm -hmm. I had to go against the grain of this movie. And I think my NFL career was shortened because mm. people thought I was just this dumb offensive lineman that was portrayed in the movie that was just athletic. When in actuality, he got good grades and was competent, but came from a, str a troubled home. Sure. I just um, I was just reading. And again, who knows exactly. at this point? Their response is that he's attempted this type of shakedown before of them, that they were fair to him, that they gave him this, that they provided him with nothing but love, that... <laughs> yeah, 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 this is the problem. And I mean, it's... Like I, I mean, I, I get the courts uh, will uh, hopefully get good evidence and figure out what went down. It's... It's fishy to me that he's signed to a conservatorship. That's very fishy. I guess, I, ultimately, we don't know what happened, but I think either of these are true, or, sorry... Either outcome is totally plausible, which yeah. means that we live in a world where both of these things can be true, where a loving family can provide tremendous amounts of support for someone outside of their family unit, try to be fair with them, be fair with them, give them everything, and then have a shakedown many years later. We also live in a world where a ostensibly loving family can prey upon someone pretend to love them, sign them into legal documents that benefit them at their expense, and then ride them for everything that they're worth. Yep. Uh, what struck me as I was 
listening to this was the possibility, which I'm not saying is the case, of that second scenario where, and I think that this is, it's not every well, type this, this of- the, We've heard kind of their story through the movie where they mm -hmm. were the loving family. And so now we're hearing this other side mm -hmm. of his, which is new. Yes. The, the part that struck me, and this is where it comes to the seeing and the feeling and all that, was, I'm not sure which one is the case. I wasn't there. So yeah, yeah. we'll maybe know a bit more later. But in the possibility that his claims are- more emotionally true or empirically true. The idea that, which I think is true, there are certain kinds of people who cloak their taking advantage in uh, benevolence, right? So I think that you see a lot of stage moms in this role. You see... Uh, so, People that are, I'm not saying that the people who do charities are like this, but they're, they sometimes are very big to charity. They do these kinds of things. And I think what is tricky is that when you're evaluating someone as good or bad, focusing on simply the facts of their situation is not enough because yeah. I believe that Scott Harrison, who runs Charity Water, is a big hearted guy who is doing his greatest in this. And I believe that there's somebody else at another charity who is using it as purely cover. And from the outside, they're going to look similar. And so part of the seeing that I was just thinking of is I was going, how would I know if I were looking at this from the outside? Because the facts are going to look broadly similar, right? And until you dig into the nitty gritty details of the, of the, documents that they signed and who got what etc yeah yeah it goes back to attention uh intention yes well rather than that it's i do think that as i've gotten better at piecing myself together instinct and horse sense is starting to come online now i don't think that anyone should ever go to jail for my instinct yeah, or yeah. horse sense ever you know this is not but i do think that it's important that people treat their instinct like a veto switch and get in touch with their instinct and don't learn to override their instinct of something feels fishy here in order to avoid FOMO or fit in with a group or whatever. I think developing, developing and cultivating, your instinct saying yes, by the way, isn't a sign that you're <laughs> definitely not gonna get screwed. But I do think that, that uh, having communion with your gut about contracts, deals, people, Etc. is a really important thing to do. And people learn to, and I've learned, to elevate out of that and go to the, the details of the contract and look for specifics. And that's all incredibly important. I, I don't want to say that you shouldn't do that. But I do think that it's important that people maintain gut level connection yep. of what this feels off. And that doesn't mean that you slander the person's name. It doesn't mean that you tell everybody, don't ever do business with this person because you don't know. But it's just for some reason... It's this isn't right for me and letting it be just that it's a no for me mm -hmm. it's just a no for me you know that i think that's uh how you are going to be more likely to catch people who cloak themselves in all of the outward goodness that might fool your due diligence were you to look at it from that perspective but there's often a gut sense of like this doesn't feel right i can't put my finger on it and yep. it's and it's important to develop that it, of course, can be sensitive in either direction depending on the traumas that you've experienced, right? So you can constantly be running around with gut that you can't trust anybody. That needs to be worked on. But the answer is not to throw that gut instinct out. The answer is to have a greater dialogue with that gut instinct and really listen to what it's saying and get to the point where you can be like, I trust my veto button. Yeah. Sometimes I'm going to miss out as a result of it. That's okay. Like this, this thing is loves me. <laughs> yeah. I had a similar feeling of like just didn't feel right. I was watching Logan Paul speak to his brother, Jake on the podcast. Great one. And, uh, it was a minute clip and I just went, what the, f <laughs> uh, this just, no, just <laughs> no, this doesn't feel right. Whatever's being said here. Uh, and to give you some context, they're talking about the business deals that were allowed in Jake's promotion. His promotion is called MVP. He does boxing. Um, and his brother Logan is saying, what the heck is the deal that I can't bring my drink prime to your promotion? Mm -hmm. And they're arguing back and forth. Um, and you can find the clip online yourself. And the feeling I had was that, which is just like, this just doesn't feel right. Yeah. Like, I don't trust either. I don't trust mostly Logan's argument of why he just wants his drink to be in the promotion. It's not that big of a deal. Why can't I bring it? And then Jake's like, 
if it's not that much big of a deal, why are you making, why are we talking about it right now? And it just like things didn't add up. I saw some gaslighting coming yeah, in. Yeah. Um, you remember the clip, right? Of course. I think that uh, I, I, you and I are different in this and we have different strengths and weaknesses. I've always been very cerebral and can oftentimes, I could watch that clip and point out the holes in Logan's argument. Yeah. And But this Chris is why McMahon. this isn't fair, Chris right? McMahon. Chris McMahon, this is why this isn't fair. But there's some times where that faculty, I can't find the issue and then I'm stuck. I go, well, I guess you're right. You've always been better than me at horse sense. Mm. And, you've str- and the people, it's interesting, the people that I, I haven't had enough respect for people who say, I don't know why, but no, or I don't know why, but yes, or I don't know. Like I can, I'm better than that. I can like point to like three things that like this just don't add up. Yeah, you but can, it, exactly. But I don't have the psychological definition of the DMSM book of why it doesn't add mm-hmm. up, but I'm like, that doesn't add up with this. Yes. I'm not saying that you have no capacity yeah. to. I'm saying that for my logical mind, you haven't formed an airtight deductive argument that precludes any bullshit possibility. Me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and you like, go, bullshit. I don't need an what airtight. What you're saying <laughs> now is bullshit. You don't need an airtight I understand. I, but, I, but I think that those are two broad types of yeah. individuals. Some who can uh, intellectualize and then argue their perspective and others, and I feel I felt this with Jake for as long as I've watched Jake, is just like he's not always able to verbalize exactly what he's thinking, wanting, or saying, but he can, he can clearly feel that it's yeah. fucked up. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is fucked up. You can tell he's biting his tongue, and he I think he's like, got a long history of his brother screwing him yeah. um, and telling him that he loves him and then screwing him and then hooking up with his girlfriend, and, you know, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. all, the, all that crap. Um, but yeah, I, am, uh, I made the video about Logan where I looked at the specific details of this, that, and the other thing, and, the, you know, whether I'm right about him is a moot point, but I, I am trying to develop that sense and it, uh, he sets it off for me definitely increasingly when I see him. And this is the other thing that is confusing. He's very charismatic and likable at other times. And this is one does not preclude the other. He was going to be very successful in a, in a, in a number of ways, but it's, he's not for me. I don't know, but that's, that's, and that's what I take away rather than in the past, I've tried to come up with objective reasons and even made videos of like why this guy's a narcissist and where I can point to the exact moments that he's doing. Because their nar- eyes were like this. I'm just doing narcissism, <laughs> which, you know what I mean? It's just like, um, I think I made good points, but the place that that video came from is, oh, I don't like this. Yeah. I don't like this. And I need to be able to explain exactly Something why. Something doesn't add up with yeah. that lady, yeah. the Aranos lady. Something crypto zoo is going to be done. We're so, yeah. yeah. It's just, and I, and again, I go to the specifics of what you said and what actually happened. It's just like, they're just tip-offs for you to... These are just words that you yeah. say to get what you want and get people to, to stop bothering you so you can go find another way to make money, yep. um, which is, it seems obvious. And then the um, last one that came up while we were doing this, I forget the guy's name. He was in Usual Suspects and his uh, trial just was totally dropped or whatever, or civil or... Um, oh, Kevin Spacey. Yeah. And like, I don't have any feelings towards that, but it was just like, it came out and like, yeah, it's a he, Reddit post. It's like, no one's talking about this. No one's but talking about so he, the civil trials. Was uh, He was acquitted. Of of, I don't charges. know if you're acquitted in a civil trial, but he he won his civil, or was it a criminal case? It might have been a criminal case. I think he might have won his criminal case, which is a higher standard to be held to mm. than a civil case. But in any case, Kevin Spacey got hard canceled and did not go the way of Harvey Weinstein or um, you know the the other guys who were just yeah, we got him. He's yeah. literally going to jail. So we'll, it, don't know too much about that. Well, it'll be interesting to see what, what comes of it. Um, my sister sent us a video of her baby walking, and uh, unrelated babies are always uninteresting for just about everybody else in the world. No, <laughs> I just get men. It. Just men. Men just don't just don't feel it. This is the first time that I felt the connection with like an infant in, yeah. in my life. Uh, but what I could say that is for all of us is – Watching the honest to God fearlessness of children is very instructive to me. So he's learning to walk and nobody's making him. He's getting his ass wiped and his diaper cleaned and food shoved in his mouth and everything's, but he wants to stand. And when he hits the deck, boom, you know, like he falls and he, uh, he is unafraid in a way that is truly inspiring to me, given his fragility. And I think of what this guy with is going to learn to speak English, walk on two feet. He's, he's going to do it all in four years. 
Yeah. Now, I understand that we have different brains and plasticity, but certainly part of it is his willingness and his complete ambivalence towards failure. It just doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> yeah. Like he is, he is just going to, he's going to say the wrong word. He's going to take the wrong step. He's going to stub his toe. He's going to crack his head. He's going to do, he's going to do everything, man. And he's, as of now, unafraid. I actually think fear kicks in as you get older and you decide, oh, that experience of skinning my knee, I never want to have again. Or that experience of saying the wrong word and having all the kids look at me, I never want to have that again. Yep. And you, you shut down areas of your life because you're afraid to encounter experiences that you've probably already lived through in Got many it. cases. I saw the same video. So what are you thinking for bringing that energy into your life? How would you manifest the standing up and not being afraid to fall? What it made me realize is, and this is just a very personal one, is that um, when I go to, we have these journeys, and I encounter my infant, I often, my, my inner child, like I've talked to seven-year-old me, but I've, I have a real difficulty with the vulnerability and the fragility of the littlest version mm. of me. And I thought that that part of me was afraid. And I realized that the part of me that is afraid is not the little guy. The That's little the guy is fearless. It's the older version of me that is afraid of the utter and total vulnerability and love of that little thing. And when I say love, I think I have a different definition increasingly than other people, which is an utter and total acceptance of life. And let, truly, without coping mechanisms to avoid or escape anything, it's just head-on confrontation with experience when you're that little yeah and as you get then you know you get old enough to dissociate and then you get old enough to turn away and then you get old enough you get old enough to reject experience which is incredibly important and i don't want to go back to being an infant where my love of the world is an inability to do otherwise yep but i go wow if i could and i'm working like the fear is not that little guy it's a four-year-old five-year-old a seven-year-old a 20-year-old me that's afraid of the total embracing of life and everything that it has in it that I see him have. And it just, yeah, it makes me realize that there is a real fearlessness there, that fear crept in later. And I have projected fear and weakness onto infants when in reality there is such strength in fragility the ability to be imagine if you had a choice there's bravery 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 yeah right to be in that position to be and, so fragile and, and, do it and anyway. continue on is yeah. just brave and it's actually an older version of me with the capacity to reject things turn away deny say no say i won't put myself in that position yep. that is the where that is where the fear is and that yeah by recovering some of that um infant energy that I could, that's where some of that seeing can really deepen and be like, I'm not looking away. And not because I'm a kid who can't turn his neck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I could look away, but I have the courage to choose to look at death, to look at my failures, to look at my weaknesses, to look at my strengths, to look at my pain, to look at all of it. That is like, ooh, if I can bring that piece in. And he's a, he's a really, I feel very lucky to have been reminded because if I look at what I've avoided, you're like, what are you avoiding, man? I don't look at infants, man. I have avoided children like the fucking plague. Yep. I don't talk to other people's kids. I don't want to be around kids. I don't go to places the kids are at. It's I don't interesting you say that because after um, meeting and becoming an uncle and then having similar experience to you, I look at parents with young kids and stare at their kids now in a mm. way where they literally didn't exist in my brain. Yeah. Someone with the stroller, I was like, that sucks for them. Yeah. They have a stroller and they got to get a plane or they have a stroller and they got to get in line with that. Is that thing going to start making noise soon? Yeah. And I'm like, what's in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You having a day now, guy? Yeah. Like wondering what's going on what beauty he's got going on or sure. she's got going on sure is a cool update that i didn't realize until you said that i'm more pulled towards the originality and the authenticity of mm -hmm. a infinite that is undeniable because it's they cannot deny yeah it's doing them yeah they will shit their pants and they don't care <laughs> yeah and so there is i think life is in a straight like there's this u-shape to life which is you come in with unconscious love and authenticity yeah utterly total 
as you develop, you separate into conscious inauthenticity. And then it becomes unconscious inauthenticity because you make a choice to not do something and very quickly that becomes an unconscious response of, oh, I can't, I'm, nope, put that one away. And the journey of life is coming back into conscious authenticity, which yeah. is how do I uh, be me, embrace the truth, hold both the capacity to say no to things and which which is a whole paradoxical cluster, but is but is a real human potential. And I think that infants, while not of course the end goal, they are, but are, are a very helpful refresher in that. And so, it just in whenever I see him, it uh, I get something from that, which is powerful. Yep. Yeah. Anything else? I don't think so. Wonderful. Well, that's it for me, I think. Appreciate you guys. We're going to have a bunch of guests coming up over the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for that. If you want to join our Patreon, we talk about what we've learned this week inside the businesses specifically, and we answer your questions. So if you have a question, you can ask it there. I'll answer it directly. And I think that's it for us. That's it, bro. All right. Peace, everybody. Peace.